Okay. So we will start. Uh, can one of you tell me if you are able to hear me? Okay, fine. So I'll share this screen now. So today, as I uh, told you earlier, we will start this new segment uh, on explainable and interpretable machine learning. Um, so uh, this is again a pretty interesting uh, area of research and it has grown uh, since 2016 uh, and has uh, got a lot of uh, attention uh, in the recent years. So uh, the first paper that we are going to read uh, is uh, Why Should I Trust You? Explaining the Predictions of Any Classifier. So this uh, work was published uh, in KDD 2016 by a, a group from University of Washington. And uh, I am using the slides prepared by the first author, Marco, who has generously permitted me to use his slides for uh, teaching you. So uh, I'm very grateful to Marco. Thank you for allowing me to uh, use your slides for uh, taking this class, uh, especially during these trying times. So I'm really grateful to you. And hopefully I'll be able to do justice to your paper. Okay, so Let's start with the uh, age old picture, right? So question is how do you build an application with machine learning? So at one end, you have data and on the other hand, you have some possible application which you want to probably build up okay? using the data at hand. So, and here comes the role of machine learning. So you devise a machine learning model. So this, this is an old story, uh, but we will see how uh, a new flavor gets added to this old story. Then from there, you make certain predictions as well as certain decisions, which are then fed to the application so that you can finally achieve your end goal. So this is kind of the standard framework uh, used in any uh, machine learning application development. Now there is this important point that people started realizing of late and that is the trust challenge. So the questions that uh, people put forward here are like, is the model really working? I mean, leave others. Can we convince ourselves that the model that we have developed is really serving the purpose that we want it to serve. Okay. So I guess many of you have heard about uh, these ideas of garbage in, garbage out, right? So uh, basically uh, you put some data which is not processed in a correct way and then based on this biased, unprocessed data, you get some predictions which in the real world scenario, you know, does not make much sense. So this is the idea of garbage in and garbage out. And this has actually uh, become a very um, burning problem in the machine learning literature. And people have tried to come up with various different uh, you know, ways to tackle this. And one of these, uh, under this umbrella, one of the approaches is to develop interpretable and explainable machine learning framework, which we are going to look into uh, a little bit in the in today's lecture and in the next few lectures that follow. So again, I reiterate, so it's like you want to convince yourself as well as the others through certain explanations or interpretation of the model that, okay, whatever you have developed is actually serving a realistic purpose. So think of a, you know, a 
what would you call it a simple model or a complex model this one what does this picture portray in your mind is it a complex enough model for you or is it a simple model any answers on chat are welcome yeah it's a quite complex one so as shoham has pointed out correctly so it's a quite complex model now the question is like uh, you know how do yeah compared to standard linear models of course this is a much more complex model so the question is like uh, how the hell do you understand that that whether it's serving the purpose that you uh, actually meant it for or designed it for okay so that's the uh, million dollar question that uh, this area of interpretable and uh, explainable machine learning uh, research is trying to answer so so far what you have seen in the literature is you do these two things learn the model and deploy the model okay so these are the two parts that you are more or less aware of any machine learning 101 course would have actually taught you these two parts uh, how to learn a model from data and then how to de deploy the model for uh, serving a real world application now comes and sit in, sits in between these two is something called a trust model and what we want to uh, see in the uh, next few lectures is that how do you know you operationalize this trust model but even before we go to this formal uh, operationalization approach what why do you think that this trust model is actually required so are there really any benefits of developing this trust model some thoughts as usual on the chat window why do you think that one would be interested in developing a trust model so nothing comes free right as i told you earlier also you need to invest to develop this but is it worth the investment what are the purposes that it might be able to solve yeah might be helpful in understanding the model that's true anything else that already i have pointed out is there anything else again i let me let me invoke the baniya in you okay see uh, the way that we have been discussing some of the problems in our earlier lectures in class so as a baniya why would you be interested to in invest in this trust models exactly so can we determine so srijan says can we determine uh, it is worth if it is worth having the model it would be easier to sell the models of course it would be easier to sell the models as real solutions to business problems true anything else yeah sritikda has a very good point it could help us actually reinforce and make the model better improve the model and i guess you have got all of them so these are some of the answers you actually develop larger trust in standard ai applications like say netflix so how do you know whatever netly netflix recommends you is actually worth recommending okay so if netflix provides you with recommendations and tells that okay i am recommending you uh, this particular movie or this set of movies because you have earlier watched these this movies or your friend has watched this this movies etc then that then that is something that you will be able to rely upon more then another uh, part is where uh, machine learning as you know uh, is being used in um, uh, medical diagnostics a lot these days okay uh, starting from drug repurposing uh, to understanding patient health to comparing um, uh, patient uh, with other earlier patients having similar conditions and therefore similar prognosis okay so all this decision making would become much better if you could you know have a 
trust toward the model in the sense that suppose you your uh, machine learning model given a patient history is predicting certain drug so it could be a black box prediction or it could explain like why it is predicting certain drugs to uh, the doctor and if such explanations uh, are there then it is much more easy for the doctor to make a more informed decision and as Sritirtha pointed out very correctly, it's, it has the potential to improve the model. So what do you do? You try to get the data, you try to use features, uh, build the model, evaluate the model, and then you try to explain or interpret the model and use this interpretation back into the model, you know, in order to make the model better. So that's the idea. So the, now the question is, like, how do we gain trust in ML? So before we go into a full-fledged formalization, can we actually develop some, you know, some uh, paradigms which can help us in understanding or gaining trust, in gaining trust in any machine learning model? So the question is, how do we gain trust? First is if the model itself is interpretable, okay? So example could be like this. So what sort of a model is this? What sort of a machine learning model? What category of machine learning model does this belong to? Anybody? Yeah, decision trees. So these are decision trees, okay? And uh, why does, or TART models? So, which are like the regression version of the uh, decision problem, okay? So, uh, and why does the author uh, point out these to be as interpretable? Can you see this example and quickly tell me? Why do you think that this model is interpretable? easy to identify the reasons for prediction. That's what Shoham says. Yes, correct. So uh, it's a very simple decision-making problem where, where you are asking if the sex is male, if it is no, then uh, survived, then the decision is survived. If, it, if the age is larger than 9.5, then the decision is died. If uh, somebody has a sibling with age 2.5, then uh, the decision is more, mostly survived and a little bit towards tilted towards die. Now, question is, okay, it's a good model, interpretable model, but then what is the caveat? What is the caveat? Lacks in accuracy. Very good. So it's like, so look at those numbers. 36%, 61%, 2%, 2%. So while the model assigns very high probabilities to certain levels, the actual accuracy, when you compare things with the ground truth, is much, much less. Okay. So this is a problem with this kind of model. So although these models are interpretable, their accuracy is really poor. So this is what is like the main problem with this kind of a um, interpretable and simple model. However, these interpretable models can, can themselves also be very complex at some point in time. For instance, think of a decision tree that looks like the one that I highlight on the right now. And suddenly, the probabilities associated to these levels at this stage of the decision tree has become higher. It becomes extremely difficult now to interpret the model, right? So it's not as simple as the left one. Okay. So even these kind of interpretable models might become complex at some point in time and lose the interpretability. 
accuracy is accuracy something uh, good enough to trust if i say that i have a highly accurate model would you trust it would you have enough reasons to trust it say i tell you that i have a model with 94% accuracy would you have enough reasons to trust it what do you think the data might be unbalanced that's a very good point the data might be unbalanced there might be more other reasons okay but this is one reason for instance yeah no dependence on evaluation set very good this is the point that we will see so there is no defect dependence on the uh, so uh, the uh, observations that you draw from the training data does not hold for your test data okay so yeah because out of sample error could be high so lot of lot of points so the the imbalance point is actually also very well taken which i'll not discuss but you can uh, observe this in problems like say link prediction suppose you have a very very large graph and you know that the uh, social networks that you see in the literature are typically sparse most of the um, pairs do not have an edge between them now say if you do an do a link prediction and measure the accuracy okay uh, what what would be your typical observation what would be the accuracy if you measure if you blindly measure the accuracy for a graph for a sparse graph which has say most of the edges missing and you want to predict the links what would be your accuracy it would be high or low overall accuracy it would be high or low it would be very high okay so it would be very very high why because most of the times your training data will say that a pair of nodes do not have an edge and that is what we will also get in the test data and therefore if 98% of the cases you don't have an edge between uh, a pair of nodes okay so your model will be predicting that there is a lack of connection and therefore the model is accurate the, the model is highly accurate so and therefore in this case accuracy does not really you know help measuring accuracy does not really help another example another very convincing example is what we will see now so the authors did this analysis they took a, a 20 new news group subset okay and they for each of this uh, news item in this news group okay they wanted to assign an alignment of the item to either it being atheism either it being like exposing atheism or exposing christianity okay so that is what they tried to do so you have this 20 news groups data set you take a subset from this and then you try to assign to each of the items in this data set a label of either atheism or christianity taking or extracting certain features from this data set okay and what do the authors find this model is 94% accurate okay now the caveat is or even before the caveat why why was it accurate because the model was you know taking clues from email addresses names etc which was making or allowing it to predict the uh, the say the class of the uh, news item with a very high accuracy however when they tested on a recent data set by which they mean that there is a time gap between the two data sets okay they had the initial 20 news groups data set from where they picked the training as well as the test data now they have a separate Uh, test data set which actually have been taken at a later time point okay which has a bunch of uh, new news items and on this data set they find that the accuracy is only 57% if you take this as a test data set the accuracy actually drops from 94% to 
57 percent. Okay, so therefore, this is unreliable. So accuracy is not something that can be actually, you know, uh, thought to have a high correlation with trust. Of course, it is a must have. We all know, we all agree to that, but then it's not something that can be thought of as a proxy for trust. A-B testing. Perhaps this is one of the best ways to do, the, do things. So in many companies like where they can afford, they launch um, an A-B testing among their uh, you know, customers and uh, say for instance, uh, Facebook has two ad variations, variation A and variation B. And what you see is that uh, in variation A, the uh, uh, conversion rate, that is people actually subscribing to the ad and buying something is 17%, whereas uh, for ad variation B, it is 11%. So this actually works almost like a ground truth. However, this is slow. You have to do an A-B testing for it. It might take, you know, days and months to do to launch an A-B testing. It is expensive. And the third and a very important point is that it might be very tricky to interpret properly. This I have already told you earlier. Can you recall why, why the observations could be tricky? Can one of you recall? Why the A-B testing observations could be tricky? This has to do with the bias literature that we had studied earlier. Yeah, sampling bias, more importantly, selection bias. You remember selection bias? You select people who already probably would have subscribed to product A. Okay. And therefore you have a bias in the sample. So that is something that one has to be very cautious about. And then there is this last one. I don't know how helpful this one is. You have a gut feeling. I am an expert and the results look good. Okay. Most of the times we do this without going for an interpretation, a full-fledged interpretation of the data. We just say, okay, okay, so uh, the accuracy is good, the F-score is good, let's go ahead and write the paper. Fine. So uh, I we are an expert in... Um, you know, uh, anticipating the results or interpreting the results. Let's not go any further. So these are some of the issues. So then question is, how does one gain trust? The problem is still not resolved. So making individual predictions and making a model interpretable actually takes us to solving the following problems. So what would an explanation look like? So if you have to develop a trustworthy model, we have to first see how would we expect an explanation to look like. Let's say, let's take that news group example. Okay. So let's say we have this news item. Okay. This is from uh, this newsletter item. This is from Keith Richards and the subject says Christianity is the answer and the um, content reads, I think Christianity is the only true religion. If you'd like to know more, send me a note. So given your human perception, what do you think should be the class of this particular item? What should be the class? It's easy to infer, right? The class should be Christianity, as Kostov and Aditya has pointed out. I guess all of you have also uh, interpreted so. However, to the surprise of the authors, this is what happens. The prediction probabilities for atheism is 0.82 and for Christianity is 0.18. Now the question is, why did this happen? So there are two questions here. Why did this happen? 
and how does one actually go and fix it but the first thing that you have to answer or observe is why did this happen so the authors were typically using some sort or some variant of a bag of word model which actually tries to assign probability probabilities or likelihoods to every individual word or keyword okay so on one side is atheism and one side is christianity so you have two words in support of christianity and that gives some confidence in the word christianity and therefore the label christian however now you see certain interesting things happening do you see why the entire post tilted toward atheism because there were too many words with typically high likelihood inclined towards the class atheism okay now why did this happen as you would have rightly guessed the words hosting and host actually appeared in almost 21% of the training examples always in atheism class and the word kate to the author's surprise appears in 11% of training examples always in the atheism class so the previous one 21% was almost always like saying 95 96% of the cases it was always in uh, the atheism class whereas kate was always in the all the 11% occurrences in the training examples was always always in atheism so you see like if you now look or unfold what happened you get to see the true picture so this is the reason why one should actually go back and try to unfold the picture okay so we have 10 minutes time we will try to see how far we go so therefore this model does not generalize and therefore there is no reason we should be trusting this model so then what are the three must haves for a good explanation so these are the following three must haves for a good explanation we discuss these one by one it should be interpretable okay so humans should be able to easily interpret the reasoning you should not give a very complex reason which itself is not which itself humans are not able to understand okay that should not be the idea so for instance this is not definitely interpretable okay while that small uh, decision tree that we saw earlier uh, is potentially interpretable but the one that you see on the left side is definitely not interpretable okay it should be faithful it describe it should describe how this model actually behaves okay so that is what it means by uh say calling it faithful okay for instance look at this plot okay so say this is the uh, x versus y plot where x is the uh, input say single uh, feature and y is the prediction okay sorry y is the uh, real outcome so y is the label and x is the input feature okay now say you have a learned model like this so which is a polynomial curve fit so now if you try to define an explanation or obtain an explanation which looks like this yellow line then of course this is not a faithful uh, explanation to the model right so you have to have a more faithful you should be able to design a more faithful explanation for the model so for this particular learned model what we see as the yellow line is not a very faithful model and the third and a very important thing is that the explanation that you give should be model agnostic okay so if you are explaining something 
okay then that explanation based on the input features should be agnostic of whatever model you use whether you use a logistic regression whether you use a um, uh, svm whether you use a, a decision tree whether you use a card none of these should be giving different different explanations okay so shoham has asked so i already gave you an example is that fine or should we uh, give some more examples is the example fine shoham okay so you are not able to understand okay so for instance say you have a Okay, fine. So he's asking for a repeat. For instance, say you have one single feature, okay, X, and you have one predicted level Y. You can also consider this as a uh, either a regression or a, a classification problem, whatever. Okay. So you have one uh, input level X, and you have an output uh, level Y. Okay. So now. Uh, say these are your x versus y plot real values okay. these are your real values now if you train a machine learning model okay so the, which is typically in this case a regression would be a better uh, ex, better example um, than ex, uh, than classification of course you can think of a multi class classification but i guess regression would be a better example here so you have x and an output y which are like these are the real world values of y okay. now say you have you have defined a machine learning model you have tried to train a machine learning model and then the model has this kind of a fit okay so you have learned this polynomial function as the fit for the model okay. now given this model suppose you try to give an explanation why this polynomial and not some other polynomial okay so that is the question that you ask why do i predict this polynomial given this set of features and not any other polynomial however in order to give that explanation if you actually construct another model whose explanation you know how you have constructed you it you know but that model looks like a straight line like this okay so as if you are developing a proxy we will talk about this idea uh, in a while from now okay as if you are developing a proxy model to explain the fit okay however if you develop a proxy model like this yellow line whose interpretation you actually know then that is not a very faithful proxy that is what the authors are telling so you should even if you develop a proxy model to explain the original model the proxy model should faithfully represent the original model and the assumption underlying assumption is that the proxy models interpretation you actually know and from there you can actually interpret the uh, or you can get an interpretation get a reasonable interpretation of the original model that's the idea that's what we will see soon is this clear we'll see it soon through examples okay right. and then the third thing is that it should be the model should be uh, sorry the uh, uh, explanation should be model agnostic okay so given any ml model whatever explanation you go give should be applicable for instance can you explain this mess so many of you have already come across probably of this architecture which is called lime local interpretable model agnostic explanations okay this is the algorithm that we will study in the next class but but just to give you a, a small starter on this okay so the key ideas uh, that lime borrows are you pick 
a class of interpretable models okay models that are interpretable by humans like for instance shallow, shallow decision tree sparse features etc however this is not globally faithful then what do you do you try to design a locally approximate global black box model okay a simple globally bad but locally good model yes this is for any input both image and text we will see soon how line can work on both text and image okay we will soon see not in today's class but in the next class we will see that how the algorithm that we develop works both on text and image okay so this is a, a very interesting uh, first hand algorithm that the authors develop which actually gives very nice interpretations of your typically non interpretable model so what they will develop is a locally approximate global black box model okay it's simple model globally bad but locally it's very good the local explanations that it gives is very good so we stop here and next week you will have a class on tuesday at 9 pm bye hari any more questions we are running out of time any more questions yes i'll point out to the resources soham is asking for resources i'll point out to the resources that i will explain in the next class yes i'll explain the second point
ओके स्टूडेंट्स कैन यू हियर मी कैन सम वन रेस्पॉन्ड ऑन दैट विंडो ओके फाइन सो देर आर अ फ्यू अनाउंसमेंट नंबर वन देर विल बी अ गेस्ट लेक्चर बाय प्रोफेसर इंद्रजीत दुबे टुमारो आई हैव ऑलरेडी सेंट अ मेल टू ऑल ऑफ यू दैट विल हैपन एट द नॉर्मल क्लास आवर from 11 to 12 and we will have three more classes next week and end our syllabus so anyway the uh, vacation period has started but then like we are due by only three more classes so i was uh, thinking of finishing it in one go otherwise there will be a discontinuity so let's finish the classes in one go and then uh, like we can have all the evaluations etc uh, that are pending once the uh, institute gives us proper directives as to how to proceed further so uh, uh, for the term projects uh, i am thinking that uh, you keep in touch with uh, your mentors here and uh, uh, keep doing the work maybe we will do a stock check with uh, different groups uh, on on one particular day uh, mid april that's not the presentation but we would like to understand how far you have done etc and some of you if you want uh, like uh, you can invest more effort uh, and Uh, try to see if some research uh, directions can be formulated uh, because anyway it seems that um, for the dual degree students a uh, internship uh, is uh, not intern internship or prospective is not very clear at this point so i imagine that you will have some time just think about it and let us know but we will have a stock check by around mid of april when all your assignments submissions etc for the other courses will be open so that's it uh, we will uh, start where we left last day and share this screen okay so can someone tell me if you are able to see the screen okay fine so uh, we were discussing about this idea of interpretable uh, machine learning or uh, trying to make the uh prediction outcomes of a black box learning algorithm more interpretable and explainable and uh, there we actually saw this uh, idea of uh, uh, the authors uh, talking about uh, the specific uh, algorithm that they uh, develop uh, which they name line and uh, so what what it does is like that the pre idea is like uh, you pick a model uh, class interpretable by humans like for instance uh, some shallow decision tree or some sparse features but this is not globally faithful then what do they do they use some locally approximate global model which uh, is globally bad but locally good so i remember shritidha asked me to actually elaborate on this point more so today we will see how this uh, actually uh, works what is their exact idea and how it works so basically this can be understood if we look at their at the algorithm that they proposed so uh, before that 
let me tell you what this picture actually shows so uh, because that would be uh, handy for understanding the algorithm imagine that you have a machine learning algorithm which has actually given you a partition that looks like this okay. so the partition looks like this where uh, on one side of the partition are the uh, is the pink region and the other side of the partition is the blue region okay and it's a two dimensional feature space where you have this kind of a, imagine i mean this is just for without any loss of generality okay so you have a uh, partitioning like this so one set of data points say uh, plus should be uh, inside this um, uh, light pink region whereas the other set say uh, bubbles should be in the blue region typically so these are this is a, again a binary uh, classification problem and you have the machine learning algorithm partitioning the 2d space in this form of a uh, structure okay so now given this what they try to do is they try to find out or sample one instance say a plus instance which is inside definitely inside the uh, pink region now their idea is to construct a, a local classifier bind the term local classifier around this particular query example around this particular query instance or exemplar instance okay that is what they want to do and that's why they call it to be locally faithful but it is not able to explain things globally but it's a good explanation for the local data points okay we will see a little bit more about this in the next slide which will make things much more clear so given this let's start with what exactly the authors do for generating explanations so let's say you have an input instance xi okay that xi is featured as this plus in this particular picture okay now what do you do you sample some points randomly around xi okay they might belong to the uh, light pink region or the blue region fine so you sample points around x okay from the entire sorry around plus around the red plus from the entire region okay now use the complex model to predict the labels for each sample so whatever samples you have selected you predict the labels of those samples for instance uh, if you use your complex classifier you will get more or less everything inside all the points falling inside the um, uh, light pink region as pluses and those that fall in the blue region as bubbles roughly speaking okay so this is what you will get if you use the complex model to predict the levels of all the samples that you have randomly chosen around the point x next what you do you weigh these samples based on their distance from the original query sample xi so this red uh, plus in the middle is the query sample xi and now you are trying to find out the distance of xi from all the other example points that you have chosen and whose levels you already know okay so you weigh them based on the distance fine and the distance notion is clear here because it's a feature space you can always compute a distance so it could be any distance like uh, starting from as simple as euclidean distance to cosine similarity and things like that, cosine distance and things like that now learn a new simple model on this weighted samples so now 
suppose you imagine that your world is constructed of these samples only okay and all of them are weighted by the distance from the exemplar xi point okay so you learn a new decision boundary fine so you learn a new decision boundary which is kind of local and in the proximity of xi which tries to explain the points that you have sampled around xi okay so this is a this is also sometimes called the white box model so you have the complex model which is sometimes called the black box model now you have a white box model which of which is a very simple model which tries to learn a decision boundary given this uh, set of uh, instances that you have chosen and weighted them by the distance from the example xi now use this simple model rather than that complex model that you have or uh, that you had earlier use this very simple model that you have now trained to explain and as you have seen that simple models usually are much more easy to interpret okay so that's why this simple model gives a better interpretation of the decision boundary that is learned fine so this is the very simple idea so there is uh, yes so punojoy has asked a question will number of samples selected affect this local classifier we will see soon so uh, there is a caveat to this uh, particular algorithm we will talk about the number of samples selected in a while okay so please wait uh, till i reach that point but imagine that we have chosen a single query point okay at this uh, time you uh, consider that consider for simplicity that we have just chosen one single query point xi and around that xi we are trying to learn a very simple classifier which is easily interpretable one more question how is it different from piecewise linear regression on data directly so uh, we will see the difference when we actually go to the complex version and uh, observe how actually the exemplar points are chosen to represent the entire space okay so there is a uh, trick involved there and that trick is very important okay so that is what we will see later this is just the start point yeah this is also a piecewise approach but then the way you collect things here the you collect information here is very important and that we will see in a while when we actually observe how a number of samples not a single query point but a set of query points are chosen so there lies the bigger trick so uh, using this very simple um, model the authors ran a interesting example a interesting experiment okay let's see what they do let's say they have a image like this an input image like this okay and there is a complex model which tries to predict what is there in the image okay so there are the three color channels per pixel that is the input okay uh, that is how you have the input to the image to the uh, model okay so you have the three color color channels per pic per pixel and that is actually fed into the model and the model does some complex calculations on this feature set and does a prediction as to what is the level of this particular picture so this actually Uh, so i have uh, categorically taken a e taken an image example to answer shruti dhar's question last day when she was asking whether this could be uh, applicable to both text and images so what you do after that is you actually partition the image into what you call super pixels so these are a bunch of pixels okay contiguous in nature and you as if this looks like a contour right a contour on this 
particular image and there are standard image processing algorithms which when you feed this uh, image will give you a bunch of you know super pixels and once you have super pixelized the uh, picture you will get some partitions like this okay. so you will get partitions like this and note that when you have this some of these super pixels connected together that actually forms a sort of a sort of an explanation for the machine learning algorithm to give a particular level to that picture so we will see uh, soon what i mean by this so now for the time being consider that you have super pixelized the entire picture into those small small yellow regions now you can sample start sampling images okay so so sample each of these grid like structures that you see in the previous so suppose you sample this part this part this part this part this part you do many such random samples so this was the original image and the probability that the machine learning model associates to this image portraying a labrador is 0.21 okay now you want to explain why this image actually is classified as a labrador okay using the line algorithm that we have seen earlier and you have also super pixelized the images the image into different sub parts okay so now you take some part of the instances say for instance you take this okay maybe one of these your is your xi and you take some samples around the xi okay for this particular choice the decision function learned gives you a probability that it's a labrador is 0.92 okay. for example for this it will be 0.001 as you understand that many of the parts that actually would indicate it to be a labrador has been off here okay you have not chosen your instance choice is not such that you cover all the samples which actually makes the picture of the labrador visible and this one it's like 0.34 in this case why is this a little more confused why the probability has gone down can anyone tell me the third image also has the picture of the labrador more or less clear but then why the probability has gone down yes one is mridul says the hands images resembles human like features anything else that you see anything else that is confounding eyes and mouth are blocked a little fine any other important thing that is confounding guitar yes that is what is very important another important thing apart from the uh, clothes hands etc the guitar so you see the picture actually is i i mean i don't know what you feel the picture is as much as of a labrador as also of a guitar and there is a large part of the guitar that comes into this particular sampling okay and therefore the confidence in the labrador has actually reduced so so now say if you take exemplar for a particular case okay so say this is the query point so around this query point you learn a locally weighted regression and based on your query point sensitive to your query point and the regression local regression that you have learned you kind of give an explanation like this okay and call it say labrador in this case okay so so basically you have a p labrador of 0.92 in this case and therefore your regression actually tells that it is a labrador and this is the explanation so you get p labrador as 0.92 
and therefore the explanation for the corresponding explanation for calling it a labrador is given in the form of a picture explanation like this so you have a query point you learn a, a regression function by choosing other points around this point and then using this locally weighted regression you actually give a very simple explanation for your prediction so that's the key idea any questions okay if questions then uh, you can chat and i'll stop and answer now let's see if one can gain any insight okay, there is a question yeah so how are we generating the perturbed images so basically what you are doing here it's random okay so you randomly choose some of the super pixels okay so as i told you the line algorithm goes as follows so you take so just a second so you take uh, basically one example at point x now so that is a super pixel that is one contiguous yellow location that you have seen now you try to find out some now you randomly sample some other contiguous locations okay yellow locations now you find out what is the distance of this particular yellow location to all the other locations that you have sampled and then you weigh them okay so this is a random sampling fine and then from there whatever weights you get accordingly you haze or you give prominence and that's what is your new particular part of the image is that clear to you okay fine so now let us see if one can really gain insights from the explanations that line generates so they did a very interesting example trying to uh, explain the uh, outputs of the google inception neural network so suppose you have this picture so this was passed through the google inception neural network so and it gave p guitar as 0.32 so but this is a different sort of a guitar okay and the explanation for this was this part okay the explanation that line generated for assigning 0.32 to this kind of a guitar was this okay it gave a probability of 0.24 to this particular type of guitar okay because of the observations that it made from these two regions you see that it is giving very interesting although it's localized but it's giving very interesting uh, and more meaningful interpretations of the prediction and then it predicts labrador with 0.21 based on this particular explanation okay so it explains the probability that it's a labrador based on this particular explanatory picture so you see now using line you can generate localized explanation for the different predictions that or the different prediction probabilities that you obtain for a particular picture so the question that the authors next post was even more interesting and this is a game that we will play now let's see if we can win so the authors train a neural network probably a cnn okay to predict in picture whether it's a wolf or a husky okay so the first picture the prediction of the neural network was wolf and the true label was also wolf the second picture prediction was husky and the true label was also husky the third picture prediction was wolf the true was also wolf the fourth picture prediction was wolf the true was ground truth was husky 
fifth, again, prediction was Husky, true was Husky. And the last one, again, prediction and uh, true are exactly same. So this neural network you see actually makes one particular mistake, only one. Among these one, three, four, three, four, five, six examples, it just makes one mistake. So my question is, do you trust this model? And if you do, how do you think that the model is actually distinguishing Huskies from Wolves? Do you think that this is a uh, good model? I mean, in terms of trust, what is your take on it? Let's spend some time on this. Excellent. So Vishal says, so this is the answer. But uh, I guess everybody is able to see the chat window. So Vishal has actually broken the uh, suspense. Yeah. So the explanation is exactly what Vishal says. So uh, what happens is that although the model makes only one single mistake, so if you try to generate explanations, you see the explanations are as follows. So for the first one, this is the explanation. Second one, this is the explanation. Third one, this is the explanation. Fourth one, this is the explanation. Fifth one, this is the explanation. Sixth one, this is the explanation. So now, actually, what Vishal pointed out is the exact thing that the authors also point out. So you have actually built a great snow detector. This neural network model has actually built a very good snow detector. And this you become aware of only when you generate the explanation. Okay, so Vishal could manage to actually uh, eye gaze or eyeball all of them and immediately uh, give me the answer. But say there are thousands of such pictures and many such uh, variations. So uh, it would not be easy to actually uh, eyeball and uh, generate predictions or generate explanations. So therefore, the utility of line. Okay, so you try to, this is how actually try, line tries to generate explanations for very well-known and highly potential black box prediction algorithms. Many of the times, which actually give a very high accuracy, but then the trustworthiness seems to be questionable. So the question is, did machine learning people notice this? Okay, so let's see what happens. So before even you gave explanations, okay? So they did a um, survey with 20, 27 subjects who were kind of machine learning experts and they actually have got prior experience of working in vision and image processing and machine learning. Okay. So they did a survey among these uh, subjects and then they put forward two questions. Okay, Didn't trust the model and then the snow insight, if they had the snow insight or not. If they did not trust the model and if they had the snow insight. So this was, the question was given before the explanations were provided by line and as well as after the explanations were provided by line. Okay, in both the situations, this question was asked. And let's see what are the results. So there were around roughly 62-63% people who did not trust the model even without explanations. However, they did not know what is the insight, why the, sorry, why the model was not correct. So when they were asked that, do you think that the model is trustworthy? Okay, they felt that the model is not trustworthy and around 61% of people actually agreed that the model is not trustworthy, but they could not say why the model was trust trustworthy. Only around 42, 43% of people were able to identify 
that the model is just doing a job of classifying snow versus snow snow. Okay. Others could not actually identify that there is this particular thing going on. Actually, this particular uh, snow distinction is what the neural network model is doing. Okay. They did not trust the model, but they did not have the insight. And they could not tell why they don't trust the model. Now, after explanations, of course, the uh, trustworthiness actually decreased. And it decreased manifolds, like it went to 90%. Okay. The, uh, almost 90% of the people did not trust the predictions of the model. And given the explanations, almost 92-93% people were immediately able to tell that it's uh, only learning the snow distinction. The model is only learning the snow distinction. So remember that the authors were showing the pictures and the explanations. They were not telling that there is a snow insight hidden there. The subjects were to identify the insight. Okay. So before explanations, the subjects were very bad at identifying the um, uh, insight. However, given the explanations, they could immediately figure out that the model is just trying to discriminate between snow and no snow. Okay. Any questions so far? No questions? So we proceed. So, so far, uh, we have been only seeing that how you choose one single example instance okay and then sample points around it okay and then construct a local classifier which is easy to interpret or explain now how do you escalate this idea to the complete model to the whole model for instance if we go back And we ask that, no, no, now we want to not have local explanations, but we want to have global explanation on the entire space. Then what do we do? What would be a strategy to actually escalate this procedure to the entire model space? Okay. And that's what we will see in the next few slides. So now explaining one prediction actually describes the local, local behavior that we have agreed. Okay. So you have the whole space of data. You take one exemplar point, may actually then have some points surrounding that point and then build, on, uh, build a classifier on the weighted samples. Okay. Now what you can simply do, just take k such points okay and describe the overall behavior now what is the problem in this just take randomly k such points and generate explanations from them what is the problem in this There are many small, small problems. No, uh, so uh, uh, combining the interpretations is uh, not so difficult uh, because you just, you know, blindly uh, union all the interpretations. That you can do. That is one easy solution. You just blindly union all the interpretations. Now, when I have said this, can you now think of the problem? When I say this, that, you know, you blindly union all the interpretations. Can you now think of the problem? No. 
No one? See, uh, so Sritidha has given us a very nice clue. Like, how do you combine the interpretation? And I say that you take the union of interpretations. Now, and I also say that you actually randomly take some instances. My question is, what is the guarantee that you don't generate a large number of redundant interpretations? You don't have any guarantee. Fine? So do you see the problem? So you might be choosing exemplar points which makes you land up into the same set of interpretations time and again. So, and therefore the variety of interpretations that you obtain is very, very less. The diversity of interpretations that you obtain finally is, could be very, very less, could be potentially very low. Okay. Could be even in the worst case equal to choosing one single example. Fine. Am I with you? Do you appreciate the uh, problem? Can anyone tell me in yes or no? I'm waiting for an answer. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, you cannot actually avoid redundancy in explanations if you go ahead like this. So therefore, the authors drew, do a second level interesting job. So, and they try to actually select points so that you minimize the redundancy in the number of explanations. And they come up with a submodular function optimization that provides diverse set of explanations. So we shall uh, remember you asked me a question as to how this is different from the piecewise uh, linear regression type of approach. So this is where the departure is. So how you actually pick the examples now to make it like relevant for the whole model space. So they use a submodular function optimization, which actually ensures a diversity in the set of explanations that is generated. So let us imagine that we have a W matrix. So the submodular selection intuition is as follows. Let us imagine that we have a W matrix like this. Okay. So for simplicity, so earlier I have taken a, a image example. Here, let us take a text example. Say your instances are documents here. Okay. And features are some words. So it's just like a, a term document matrix okay, that you have seen in uh, many different applications, maybe who have taken information retrieval courses or any NLP courses, or even in machine learning courses, you might have observed this kind of matrices. Many of you are actually using them uh, in your uh, projects also. So you have terms uh, on one side and documents on the other side. And you typically build a term document matrix like this, where the gray cells indicate presence. So it's a binary matrix, a zero one matrix. Okay, the gray cells indicates presence and the white cells indicate absence. Okay. Now, looking at this picture, does something strike? Okay, so these are some of the local instances that you have chosen for generating your explanations. So this instance says one, two, three, four, five. Okay, these five instances you have chosen. And these are the features, okay? Running through one to D prime are the features that actually collectively describe these instances. Okay. Now, looking at this picture, does something strike? So what should be and what should not be in your explanation? Does something strike you? Just by gazing through the human eye. Is there something that strikes you?
that could be helpful in generating your explanations. Well, good. So, Sritidha says, speak those that cover as much as possible. So, question is, that's a very good point. What should we first ensure to pick for this particular example? Or what should be, what should be something that we uh, could not afford to miss? Christ, very good, yes. So, so the covered feature, so that's what actually uh, Sri Tindha pointed out. The coverage of each feature is noted down at the uh, uh, cells below, okay. Christ covers four instances, host covers two, NNTP covers two, Mary covers one, and John covers one. So we would like to typically when we select something, the submodular selection should ensure representative, more representative explanations. For instance, we should be incorporating Christ into our explanation. That is something that is kind of the most prominent observation that one makes from this uh, matrix. And then after we have done so, we try to avoid redundancy as much as possible. Okay. So in this particular case, one could go ahead with choosing this instance. Okay. Should we choose the third instance if we have chosen the second one? No, right? Because the third instance and the second instance can be explained by the same set of features. So the third instance is redundant. So then either you can take the fourth instance or the fifth instance. And that would more or less explain or incorporate everything except feature one. Fine. So that's how you cover the entire space. So the idea is to cover the entire space to generate your set of explanations. Now the question is, how do we algorithmically achieve this? Okay, so let's see how the authors try to algorithmically achieve this. This is one way that the authors proposed. You can think of your own ways. This is an interesting exercise. There can be many different ways. Actually the authors go for a greedy approach. You can think of some other uh, interesting approaches also. I'll tell you the greedy approach and then uh, probably it would give you some food for thought for thinking about other approaches also. So they compute something called an importance, which is de defined as IJ. Okay. So for every feature, they compute an importance, which is the square root of the sum of the wij values. So each cell here is a wij, right? So you compute the importance of each individual feature like this, square root of sum of wij's for all the n instances. So this denotes the importance of a particular feature column. Now, for instance, in this case, as you see, I2 will be larger than I1 because F2 can explain more instances than F1. So therefore, correspondingly, I2 will be larger, definitely larger than I1. Now, what do they do? They define something called a coverage function. Okay. And they try to populate a set V which they start off empty and they include some instance i, okay, some instance i 
such that W i j is greater than zero, and they sum it over all the different feature columns. Okay, they sum it over the importance of all the feature columns. So, for these particular instances, where so this i is the question that we want to answer. Okay, so they choose those i's for which at least w i j is greater than zero and sum over all the important scores. Okay, so one is an indicator function. So depends on how you choose your i, this value of coverage will change. Okay. Now they are picking algorithm. So the instances they, that they will pick will be an argmax over c. Okay. However, there is a budget on V. So you cannot choose all instances, right? So you have a fixed budget B and you have to populate your V such that it does not exceed the budget B. Okay. Is this clear? So this is a coverage function that they are trying to maximize. Any questions? So the idea is simple. You find out important scores for each of the features and then you sum over all the features, but then subject to those cases where you have you select some i such that wij is greater than zero. And for only those cases, you take the ij values and sum over them and see what is the coverage how much importance you have been able to cover. However, you can include only a limited number of instances to be limited by a budget, fixed budget B. So what you do at every step, you compute CVU minus I comma W I minus CVWI. Okay. You include one one instance and you find out the difference okay so this is called the marginal coverage gain of adding an instance i so and this function can be shown to be submodular so that is the gain will actually diminish over iterations as you include more and more i's okay that is guaranteed okay so this is a submodular function this will actually go down over iterations as you add more and more i to your v set okay and the there is a already a proof given by Krauss and uh, Golovin in 2014 that you reach a value which is within one minus one by e constant factor of the optimum. Okay, so you get a one minus one by e approximation of the optimum. Fine. So using this particular uh, marginal gain approach. Okay. So overall. Given that we are trying to uh, improve the marginal gain over and over time, okay, given this idea, the overall peak algorithm is as follows. So the first part is exactly similar as the simple line algorithm. So you take some instances X and you also have a budget B. This is specified. So, and now for each of the instances that you have taken, so you take a very large number of instances, okay? So to cover the entire space, you generate explanations and keep them handy, okay? You generate all the explanations for each of these and keep them handy. So these explanations are generated by the original line algorithm, okay? For every individual instance you pick, in example an instance xi that you pick from x, you generate a bunch of explanations, okay? And you keep it handy for all these example, example instances. Now you compute the importance of the features only for the set of instances X, okay? So, so these, these X is prefixed. You have initially sampled a large number of X randomly from the entire space 
Okay, now from this, and you ensure that you have picked a large, a sufficiently large number so that, you know, uh, you have generated enough explanations and you have, you are able to select from this random set judiciously. So now from this set, uh, you build the W matrix from this set of instances, you build the W matrix, you compute the important score for each feature and then you initialize V to null and then you include one one single instance such that the coverage is maximized as per the argmax equation that I have showed you earlier. Now, once the budget is over, you have a set V. Now you see in set V, what are the instances that you have gathered? Now accumulate all the examples for all these instances that you have already generated using line and that set together forms the Expla overall explanation set for the entire model space. This is how the submodular peak algorithm works. Okay. So uh, we will stop here. We will see examples of this in the next lecture. Uh, in next Wednesday's lecture, we will see examples of this particular um, uh, whole space algorithm. But if you have any questions, we can uh, have some discussion now up till this point. Next day, we will just recap the algo once more and then we will see some real utility of this algorithm. Vishal, I hope your question is now answered. Any other questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I will call it a day for today and we will meet next week.
Okay, so we will start. I'm sharing the screen with you guys. So last day we have seen how the authors uh, of this paper actually has uh, devised, uh, uh, devised an algorithm which could pick um, instances uh, judiciously so that the explanations are diverse and uh, there is minimal redundancy. So they use this submodular uh, selection algorithm uh, which uh, actually tries to maximize the coverage and uh, coverage of features and uh, uh, they have uh, shown that this is a constant factor uh, approximation of the optimum that can be obtained. So today we will see how they have evaluated this whole model explanations. So in the individual uh, model explanations. We took examples from images. Now, uh, for this one, we will see some examples from text. So, uh, one of the tasks that they designed was like, how do you choose between the competing models? So, uh, what they did was they actually floated a uh, MTARC uh, task uh, and asked people as to which model general, generalizes better. Of course, uh, in doing this, they uh, ensured that they are uh, recruiting Tarkars who are actually capable and knowledgeable uh, of doing this kind of an experiment. Okay, so it's like, so they, they did some uh, preliminary trials to find out like who are, uh, who among these Tarkars are actually eligible for going to the next round and then uh, finally, they launched their uh, exact experiment. So what they would do is that they would show snapshots of say two competing algorithms. So as you see here, on the left there is algorithm one and on the right there is algorithm two. And um, both the models actually makes a correct prediction. Okay. so. Uh, both the model says that whatever text excerpt uh, that it has seen uh, should indicate atheism. Okay, so in both the cases, the prediction is correct. It matches the ground truth. Okay, so the true class is atheism and it matches the ground truth. Now, uh, for algorithm one, the words that are uh, found important by the algorithm, okay, are uh, ordered as histograms here. Okay, so and the pink uh, bars uh, like uh, make your uh, confidence higher for atheism, whereas green bars make your confidence higher for um, Christianity. Okay, so this is that same uh, news group data that the authors were experimenting with earlier. So now, given these two uh, sets of, uh, given this. The, these two algorithms and the explanations, the Tarkers were asked like which explanation they found more logical and accordingly choose that algorithm. So now they did three types of uh, experiments. In the first one, they asked the Tarkers like which one is a better model without giving any explanation. Okay, they asked them to guess, just guess uh, which among these two uh, model, uh, which among these two algorithms or a pair of algorithms uh, is the better one, okay? So the random guessing, as you can understand, is like 50%. Okay. Some say this one is better, some say that one is better, and so it lands to land up to say this is 50%. If you take some random exemplars, okay, uh, and then apply line, Okay, so you, you use some random instances, do not uh, select the instances using peak, using the peak algorithm, 
but just use these random ex, uh, instances to generate explanations and then show the explanations to the uh, targers then the uh, percentage of people who picked the better model actually rises so uh, it seems that any sort of explanation than no explanation actually helps any sort of uh, additional explanation to the model outcomes is always helpful for the targets to identify which one is a better model and the success of the submodular uh, line submodular approach uh, is that uh, in 89 percent of the cases actually the meter mechanical targets were able to identify the trustworthy model okay. so by the way so if you would have go, gone and chosen the uh, model with the best accuracy you would have got gone wrong in this case so and this is very clear from the uh, mechanical target experiments uh, actually the uh, model with a slightly lower accuracy has uh, been seen to generate better explanations for the outcomes and that has been chosen by the targers as a better model okay. so uh, therefore you see that there is a kind of a tug of war between accuracy and trustworthiness and while both are desirable so far in the machine learning literature mostly accuracy has been given importance it's only recently that people have started thinking also in the alternative direction of like having some sort of trustworthiness uh, into the model especially because now many of these models are uh, piped into like standard uh, applications that we use day to day now as sritidha pointed uh, out last day that uh, uh, these kind of explanations can be finally again used back you know to uh, to fix uh, bad classifiers okay and that's what the authors do next so this is the last phase of this paper where the authors try to show how the explanations generated could be actually uh, reused or reapplied to make the model accuracy better so what do they do so again they take that 20 news groups data okay they have they divide it into a training set they have a test set okay and then they have a model some some xyz model with which they train okay and they predict now along with the predictions they also generate explanations okay and these explanations are then given to mechanical targets okay and these targets do something which we will uh, come in a moment what they do actually okay so these targets do something on these explanations and then after they do uh, this process the resultant is actually pumped back into the model okay so the resultant that you observe from the uh, the resultant that you obtain sorry from the um, targets is actually fed back into the model okay now you repeat this process for quite a few times and we will see what happens when you uh, repeat this process how it becomes advantageous now once you have done this for a few repetitions you evaluate on a completely unseen set so this is a hidden religion data set okay so the targets actually do not have absolutely any idea about this data set so this is just completely hidden from them okay so and when they uh, do this kind of a uh, explanation what we will see explanation pruning they don't have any idea about the hidden data set and then you do a uh, uh, end to end evaluation on this hidden data set and let's see what happens okay so what you basically do is you ask targets to click on useless words okay for the task in each round so you give some explanations and you ask the targets 
find out which among these are actually useless words and they should not be part of the explanation okay that's what you do say for example you have this particular algorithm which is listing a bunch of words which have got different um, explanatory powers okay and on the right hand side you see the exact um, uh, news group mail which has been classified into one of the groups okay uh, so that so your task is to classify this particular um, mail into whether it is atheism whether it uh, falls in the class of atheism or in the class of uh, christianity okay and the algorithm that you are using actually comes up with the ranking of the words like this so the words that uh, corroborate to or or like push the algorithm or make the algorithm think that it, this particular post is um, uh, in the class of atheism are host posting nntp etc okay while the others that are in green are uh, making the algorithm have some confidence in the other class that is christianity okay now you ask the talkers to kind of strike off some of the words which they think should not be part of the explanation because they do not actually have any uh, connection with the uh, class uh, belongingness of this particular uh, mail okay so and what the talkers can do is they can bring their mouse on top of each of these so this is a ui this is a nice ui that they generate so and you can bring on um, you can bring your mouse pointer on uh, the words that you do not feel are uh, relevant for this classification and if you click on them they, there is a, a strike of sign that comes up and also the uh, word itself changes color to red so this indicates that the talker does not feel that this word should be used as a predictive word for determining the class of this particular main chain so this is how you pass on the explanation to the talkers and the talkers actually cut off some of your features on which the algorithm was heavily relying to do the class prediction now once you do this let's see what happens so let's say this so we are trying to measure the accuracy on the hidden set the hidden set that i showed to you which the targets have not seen okay so if you train only on the 20 news groups the accuracy is very very poor okay it's somewhere um, between 0.55 and uh, 55% to 60% okay somewhere around 57 or something so if you train the same uh, model but then you try to hand clean some of the uh, um, some of the examples okay you are not using any explanations to do this you painstakingly pass through all the uh, you know uh, mails and then from there you try to hand clean some of the things okay that takes up your accuracy to 0.7 now if we bring tarkers into the picture okay and if as i said that the process repeats okay so it repeats you you have you can have a first round and then the inputs of the first round is fed again into the model then you have a second round you pass the second round through the tarkers then again you uh, uh, take the Uh, feedback from the second round and then uh, pass it into the model then uh, you have a third round and you can keep on doing this unless you see that the accuracy is kind of saturating okay and if you go round after round you see that the um, that if you train the uh, model on the uh, data that is cleaned by the tarkers you find a much better accuracy than even the hand cleaned data okay seems like that mechanical talkers can themselves do feature engineering really well so 
this this was uh, kind of an evidence to show that generated explanations can also be reused back or reapplied to make your model predictions better yeah so this is the line uh, pipeline once more so should you really trust your model or does any model really work okay that is something that uh, it tries to answer it also tries to give you insights about what the model is actually doing okay rather than only telling the accuracy and it can also help you once you have generated enough insights it can help you fix the model back okay so uh, shoham i don't know whether he is in today's lecture or not uh, he was asking about resources about this particular um, uh, software so everything can be obtained uh, on this github link okay all the important resources are available on this github link fine so we have kind of uh, finished this paper we will uh, now start a follow up paper by the same group but this paper i will not deal in like uh, in full algorithmic detail so i'll just give you a brief overview overview to show how they have escalated things from a um, you know from a simple explanation generation they have try to make things better and better so this is how a pipeline of research can be set up so that's what uh, the authors have very nicely portrayed in this follow up paper so again uh, i uh, thank marco for generously permitting me to use his slides so this is a triple ai 2018 paper okay uh, and uh, this uh, has been uh, done in collaboration uh, between university of uh, washington uci and apple research so here in this paper the authors introduce a very interesting concept of what they call anchors so you will see in a while what they actually mean by anchors but before that a bit of a motivation for the problem so again the same picture okay so you have uh, the same data on one side and you have um, an application uh, an ml application running on the other side okay so now there is a machine learning model and there are some predictions which you can think of using in your application pipeline downstream application okay. now as you see they have broken their trust challenge so one set of trust challenge which uh, line tries to partially answer was is the model really working can you improve it using the insights that you develop from the explanations does it respect business rules however there is a trust challenge too which is what they are trying to mostly focus on in this particular paper should i act on this prediction and if i do why should i act okay. this is the question that they ask precisely in this particular uh, paper by the way uh, before i go any further are there any questions with the previous paper yeah i'll share all the details etc uh, on the Uh, course website all the github course papers slides are there any questions no okay so we proceed further so here as i said in this paper their main trust challenge actually lies in these two questions so once the explanations are generated and it comes to the end user the end user has to actually see like whether he or she should act on this prediction and if he or she actually act on this prediction why should he or she do so okay 
that is the question that they are trying to ask or put forward in this particular paper. So we have already seen about this model agnostic explanations and you give these explanations back to the, so you have a black box model from where you generate explanations, maybe using line, and then uh, you give these explanations back to the end user. Now, the end user actually is confronted with some questions. Okay. So the end user, say the end user wants to do some feature engineering on these explanations and then use this um, revised set of features into a downstream application. But that could be actually risky and some of the questions are uh, confounding factors that actually could bother the end user are the following. So he might, the human, he or she might know what the model will do or might have no idea. Okay. If it is the first case, then we are all well and good. Okay. But if it is the second case, then passing it to a downstream application might be extremely detrimental. Okay. And therefore, the authors put forward this question as like, is there a way to ascertain that whatever interpretations that are generated are high precision interpretations? Okay? They are not going to fail. Okay? This is what the authors will try to actually come up with. If we could have a strategy to identify whether the um, explanations or the interpretations that are generated are high precision or not, then that would be much more helpful for the human in the loop to decide whether to pass it on a downstream task or not. Okay. So basically, they define two terms. One is coverage, which is the probability that the end user thinks he knows. Okay. Is this a good thing to is this a good thing to estimate? Quickly. Or is this a sufficient thing to estimate? Anybody has an answer? The probability that the end user thinks he knows. This is what is coverage. Is this good enough to pass it on? If this probability is high, is it good enough to pass it on for a downstream application? What do you feel? No answers? No. Okay, Aditya says no. But any clues why? Because what he is thinking might be utterly wrong. Okay. So what is more acceptable is this. Probability that he thinks he knows, okay, is right. So it's a conditional probability that what he thinks he knows is right. And this is what the authors term as precision here. So rather than coverage, what is more important is precision. This is what the authors will pitch in the rest of the paper. Now how to ensure high precision interpretations. Yeah, as I say, this is much more important. So they, in this uh, paper, they uh, take a working example of sentiment analysis using a simple LSTM uh, type of a model. Okay, so it's a deep learning model uh, which tries to uh, take text input and do an end-to-end -end training and uh, identify whether the text uh, expresses positive sentiment or negative sentiment. 
So that is what this uh, uh, simple model does. And this is what the authors will take as a working example. Let's say there's a positive example like this. This movie is not bad. So if you use the line explanations, you will get, a, get an explanation like this. So if you run line on this particular uh, instance, you will get an explanation of this form. Okay. Now, let's take another example. This movie is not very good. The explanation that is generated here is like this. Now, here comes the problem. Can anyone tell me what quickly? Given these two instances and the explanations, here comes the problem. What is the problem? Yeah, somebody has answered. Anurag, bad is related to positive sentiment and not to negative sentiment. Yes, so uh, what is more important? Uh, which, which particular word is most important, bad or not? Not, yes. As Midul sir correctly points out, it's not. So, see, this is the confounding factor. So, if the um, end user looks at this particular example and say misses this example, looks at this particular example, then and sees that not is a positive, has a positive uh, feature and tries to generalize this, okay, over all instances, then there is a problem. So both explanations, so the question is, are both explanations equally good? What is the coverage? So if you look at the coverage, there is a problem. While not is on the negative side here, not is on the positive side here. And therefore this is confounding, okay? And therefore the end users are bound to make mistakes by seeing these explanations. If the end user is seeing any one of these explanations, then such an interpretation is going to be lopsided. Okay, and therefore, if, if based on such interpretations, the end user is trying to improve the end application, then that could be actually detrimental. Okay, uh, remember the, uh, or recall the uh, 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 mechanical talkers who were trying to do this, um, uh, experiment of feature engineering. Okay, so what feature engineering will they do here? Okay. So in one case it is positive, in one case it is negative. So there is no general uh, conclusion on how the knot should be actually classified. Okay, where should it should they put it? So this might be confounding for the end users. Now, the question is, can something be done? And here comes the idea of, the beautiful idea of anchors, which the authors introduce. So you see, if you have a phrase like not bad, it is almost always going to be associated with positive sentiment. Similarly, so say for example, you have instances like this audio is not bad, this novel is not bad, this footage is not bad, okay? So uh, the presence of a phrase like not bad kind of gives you a higher guarantee that this particular statement has a positive sentiment in it, okay? These sort of phrases are what the authors call anchors okay and what is the good part of this anchor the good part is that an anchor is a sufficient condition meaning that if you have the anchor 
okay other feature values don't matter at all if you have the anchor present then it's going to be you are go, you are almost sure that this particular example is going to be positive if the anchor is not present then you cannot say anything but if the anchor if an anchor if a if a properly or judiciously chosen anchor is present in a particular uh, sentence or particular or a particular piece of text then you can with very high probability say that the uh, sentiment of that particular text is almost fully dependent on the anchor words okay. other feature values actually do not matter so here you see coverage and precision becomes synonymous do you get this so if you have covered the anchor correctly then it automatically guarantees high precision so the entire anchor has to be covered once the entire anchor is covered that's why it's a sufficient condition once the entire anchor has been covered you can very well say that the precision has been already guaranteed so a similar example can be uh, also uh, formulated for the negative sentiment say if you have an anchor like not good in the sentence like the poster is not ever good the picture is not really good the anchor is not incredibly good then this anchor would typically in many in most of the cases actually refer to a negative sentiment so there is a question can the anchors be defined for classification tasks let's say hate speech sarcasm we will see so um, in this particular uh, uh, paper the authors actually outline an unsupervised approach okay but what you are suggesting is a supervised approach of course a supervised approach can be used okay and you can simply recast their unsupervised model into a supervised model also okay so the anchor choice can be done in a supervised fashion where you can have a lexicon of anchors say if your domain is very well defined like hate speech or sarcasm you might have a very well defined set of anchors of course recall is a problem here however if your domain is like a little more open domain then probably going by what the authors have suggested would be a better idea so we'll see yeah so as i said that there is so coverage automatically guarantees high precision in this uh, style of or in this framework of choosing and so choosing anchors so now the question is how do one compute anchors okay. so this is what uh, purnojoy was asking uh, specifically so the task is not that simple as you can understand okay, there are lots and lots of choices so for instance take the example this movie is not bad and you know the level is positive okay so the potential anchor could be this the potential anchor could be movie the potential anchor could be is the potential anchor could be this movie so how many such anchors possible if words are features if words are your features how many such anchors are possible ideally or theoretically any idea yeah 2 to the power n agreed so you will have 2 to the power number of features potential anchors but that is a solution space which is extremely extremely difficult to explore so what is a um, way out so say you have some instances okay say like this audio is not bad this novel is not good and this movie is quite bad okay and you feed this into a black box model okay so this is an outline some of them are marked as positive some of them are marked as negative okay what you want is that 
given the anchor that something is marked as positive okay will have a precision probability greater than 95% okay given the anchor okay given the anchor text that you have a positive class classification that probability has to go above 95% okay okay so that is what you want to ensure now if it is a bad precision try some other model that is one possibility or try additional samples okay to make sure or to check like what is the best set of anchors okay you can either try some other model or some other anchor okay one is to try some other model or try some other anchor or try some other samples okay data samples so any three of this is possible and based on this you can actually try to ascertain which set of anchors you want to choose i'll give you a brief overview of how they do it it's a complex algorithm i'll not go into the details of the algorithm i'll just give you a very very brief overview and if you are interested you can read up the paper the algorithm that they suggest is beyond the scope of the ai and ethics syllabus this is also not taught as i as far as i understand it is also not taught in our machine learning 101 course but if you are interested you can go and uh, Uh, look into the algorithm in more details okay uh, uh, but then like uh, this is uh, beyond this since this is beyond the scope of the syllabus any question specific to the algorithm will not be part of any of the questions that you face in the exams okay so i'm just giving you a overview of giving you an overview of the algorithm if you are interested in the details please look up into the paper so the algorithm follows a bottom up kind of an uh, construction people who are uh, aware of uh, hierarchical agglomerative clustering will uh, kind of see some uh, parallels with that kind of a model here okay so suppose you have a particular sentence like this say this movie is not bad and you know that this is this has a positive sentiment okay. now in this case if you take any word as a as an anchor and check the precision say your precision is not going to be more than 50% okay something like this so this movie is not bad and what i want is that the precision boundary should be well above 95% so this is my 95% line and with each of this word as an anchor i potentially start with a 50% precision okay now i query the model okay given a particular anchor i query the model say with the anchor this i obtain a precision like this so it actually is far below 95% okay say next i take movie it's still below 95% is it's again far far below 95% not it actually goes close to 95% i mean at least part of it is above 95% okay not the mean and then bad also is far below 95% so why is there a mean and standard deviation any idea where is the question of mean and standard deviation coming because you could have multiple instances 
with these anchors and all of them will contribute to the pretty precision yeah exactly if if it is tested as anusha says if it, is it tested across various sets of samples true that is why you can have actually a standard deviation across the mean okay now if we are not happy with the precisions obtained what we will have to do either we will have to somehow randomly increase the uh, somehow randomly include more anchors or you have to change the model or you have to have additional instances let's say we have additional instances okay and these additional instances when added actually gives us more confidence in the precision values so since not has come much closer to the 95% interval so just look at what was there in the earlier step okay why was why was this not kind of acceptable why did we have to pump in uh, additional instances because not was away i mean way above the boundary we could have already chosen not in this iteration why did we have to go and add probability is less that's true what there is one more thing aditya says probability is less there is one more thing too much variation true one more thing high standard deviation all are true there is one more thing i want to listen from you no mean is less than the threshold is fine just by choosing one single anchor anchor you might not uh, be able to reach the best possible situation see what i wanted from you to wanted from you is the following that movie and not are colliding so they are confounding actually for a large portion okay so this is what is not acceptable so there should be a clearer separation that we want in order to choose an anchor and therefore we have to we had to add more instances that's what the authors do and once you add more instances you actually so there is no effect of adding more instances on ease and bad but then there is an effect of adding instances to this movie and not and not actually is clearly higher than all the other anchors and therefore now you add not in your anchor set and the precision of getting this particular uh, piece of text have a positive sentiment has already become 80% although it has not gone beyond 95% so the next trick that they use is very similar to the um, hierarchical agglomerative type of uh, clustering idea so with every individual word they add the not okay replacing only the not not case this not movie not is not bad not okay and once you have done this and rerun the model okay you see all the uh sorry not rerun recomputed the precisions all of them so by just by virtue of including the not all of these precisions have gone pretty high okay of course the mean has not crossed the 95% interval now again with these two anchors or this pair of anchors you start querying the model and what you obtain is as follows so only the not bad anchor actually surpasses the 95% confidence interval and actually the precision is 96% and therefore you stop at this point because your criteria your threshold criteria has been 
obeyed and you have got your necessary set of anchors and in this case these are not and bad so this if there is a not and bad in your uh, anchor set then with a very high confidence whatever interpretation that you are generating uh, would be highly precisely positive so in order to achieve this entire goal what the authors do is a beam search on multi arm exploration bandits okay so this multi arm exploration bandits is something that is beyond the scope of our syllabus but if you are interested you can look into the uh, details the details are there in the paper but uh, in order to follow the details of the algorithm in the paper you have to have a little bit of primer of multi arm bandit bandits okay so um if if any one of you are interested let me know i'll send you some pointers to multi arm bandits so finally they also do some user study and see the results of this anchor based approach so what do they do they show human predictions plus the, they show humans the predictions that obtain that they obtain plus explanations and ask them to predict what the model will do in new instances okay so they will show you the prediction and then they will give you the explanation and then they will ask the model sorry they will ask uh, the user what the model is going to do given a particular new instance say in one case they will give no explanations and they will ask what the model is going to do in this case they will give the line explanations okay and then they will give a anchor based explanation not bad means positive okay they will give these three type of things to the users no explanations line based explanations and an anchor based explanation now you ask them to predict only if they are absolutely sure that what the model will do okay so for instance given a new instance this book is a good one they have to say plus minus or i don't know okay they will predict plus or minus only when they are sure what the explanations are given are making absolute sense otherwise they will have to write i don't know and they do test this on various uh, pieces of text and various models so these are the summary of their results okay. so how often the first question they ask is how often these tarkers actually opted to predict okay if there were no explanations they would predict 53% of the times okay they would try to predict of course we are not telling whether predict they are predicting correctly or incorrectly we are just estimating how many times they would predict with the line explanations they would predict like around 68% of the times however interestingly given the anchors they would go for predicting only 32% of the times. given that they see the anchors they will actually try to predict that what would be the outcome of a prediction only 32% of the times okay. however what is important is that how many of these are correct so out of the 53% cases in which they do a prediction around 67% of the cases are correct only 67% for lime out of the 68% cases that they predict only 75% cases are correct but for the anchors out of the 32% cases that were they opt to predict 97% are correct so they are almost always correct and also the time required for judging so this time is in seconds the time required for judging whether uh, they are able to do the prediction and predicting thereby is like around 24 uh, 
seconds for when you have no explanations. 14 or around 15 seconds when you have lime explanations. And it's just nine seconds when you have an anchor. So the seems like the uh, people, uh, the Tarkars are very, very fast in deciding or uh, understanding uh, what would be the model prediction whenever they have the anchor text associated with the explanation. So this is how actually uh, they uh, show the importance or the relevance of having more precise interpretations than just rather having interpretations. And I think in many of the term assignments that you are doing, this kind of um, anchor tests might, might be useful. And since you are getting a much larger time, uh, I would recommend that some of you try to use these two tools, uh, the line tool and the anchor generation tool. So the authors have uh, actually made all their code, etc., public to see if you have some more interesting insights from the um, papers that, I mean, on and on top of the papers that you are already assigned to implement. Okay, so we'll stop here. Tomorrow, we will end our syllabus with the last topic where we will discuss the moral machine experiment, which was published in Nature two years back by a group of researchers at the MIT. Okay, so we'll do that, and that will be kind of the end of our syllabus. Any questions? We will wait for two minutes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Kosta asks that why there is less prediction when anchors are given. So, uh, so the point is that when the anchors are given, the uh, authors or the end users become more sure whether they are they would be able to predict something or not. Okay, and therefore they choose not to predict. In the previous two cases, mostly it was, you know, like, so in the first one, it was a random guess. The second one was also like they were in a dilemma. But in the third one, the dilemma seems to have ended. Okay. So although they are, uh, so they, they now know that whatever they are thinking will probably not be right. And therefore, they don't opt. With the anchors in place, they know probably what they're going to predict about the model is not going to be right. And therefore they opt out. Yeah, so that's the thing. So they are more sure about whether they actually know it or not. That is the question that we started off. He thinks he knows. Now the issue is that he has a higher probability of he thinks he might not know. after seeing the anchors. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll stop here and see you tomorrow.